Hi, so this will be the first video in a what will likely be four video series on collinearity and also orthogonalization because often people use orthogonalization when they have collinearity as a way of solving it, but it's, it's not a solution. FYI, we'll get there, that's in the last video. So first we need to understand what collinearity is. So that's what this video is. What it is, is it bad? And how do we avoid collinearity? So related and helpful to these, uh, this series of videos would be the efficiency videos because collinearity is actually related to efficiency. If you have an efficient design, it is less likely that it will have collinearity, <clears throat> although it's not a guarantee. But the, of all the designs you look at, the most efficient will have the lowest collinearity. So um, you can go check out these videos. There are four. And also, this is roughly following a paper, Orthogonalization of Regressors and fMRI Models. FYI, this paper has a Python notebook that goes along with it that illustrates some of these things as well. So if you love Python, I uh, recommend that. Right, and so this was with uh, Russ and JB. <clears throat> By the way, if you, okay, anyway. What is collinearity? So, We've talked about this before here, but just a refresher, it's when one regressor is highly correlated with another regressor, or when one regressor is highly correlated with a linear combination of other regressors. You're like, that is great. What's a linear combination? So a linear combination means you can get one regressor using by multiplying the other regressors by constants and then adding the results. So in this case, we have, uh, I'm gonna show two examples of perfect collinearity. If I take two times the first regressor, I get the second regressor. So that's collinearity. And here's a case where you have to do a linear combination. So two times the first regressor plus four times the second regressor gives us the third regressor. So these are both cases of perfect collinearity, and the basic idea of why this is wrong is if you, if you really like, um, if you've taken linear algebra, you've, you're probably more comfortable with this idea of spanning a certain space with vectors. And the space that you can span, uh, you can do the same thing with your regressors. Your regressors are vectors, and they span a certain space. So when you have two regressors that are exactly the same, it's not adding any information. It's not allowing you to span the space in a different way. So it's redundant information. And there are a couple problems that can occur uh, related to that. Okay. Uh, so uh, one way I like to think about the linear regression is that you're telling a story. Each regressor is trying to tell a story about the dependent variable in the model. And the p-value, effect size, and all of that reflect how well the story overlaps. So I can think of this like a car accident or something. There's a car accident and the, there's a witness to the accident. So it kind of you know, reflects the analogy is how good is the witness. So let's start with this. So here's our um, dependent variable. Here's our regressor, x1. So using the car accident analogy, this is the true cause of the accident, the gray circle. So here the witness tells a little bit about the actual accident, and then maybe she starts talking about her mother or her cats or something. So there's this extra bit to her story that is not helpful at all in terms of uh, telling the story we're interested in hearing about. So um, the p-value works in such a way that in just the traditional linear model, the p-value only reflects this shared portion here. So the sort of gray yellow portion is what x1 gets credit for. Uh, so here we have a better witness, right? So more of what they say actually pertains to the, the data or the accident, and um, less doesn't. So this would be um, a better regressor. So, okay, I haven't gotten a collinearity yet, but this is just setting up how regression works. So this, this explains more of the variability in Y, so it'll have a better p-value than here. Okay. So collinearity, what happens when you have more than one regressor, 
is you have this overlap right here between the two. So here their stories are the same. So the information is still there. That information still contributes to describing why our dependent variable, but neither regressor really gets credit for it. For it. it comes out of the residual, but the p-value and the coefficient and all that for x1 only relies on this bit here. And likewise for x2 only relies on this bit in this region here. So you can see if we go from here to here, I think those are the same, okay. But you could see that if I went, if I took x2 out, x1 would get this chunk back. I put x2 in, x1 no longer gets uh, credit for this chunk. And that's actually what we want. We, um, if, if these are telling the same story, then it's, it's not, it's almost, it's not interesting. It's interesting in a way, but typically what we're primarily interested in our models is what that thing does all by itself. What's unique to that variable. Okay, so here we have a really high collinear case. There's barely, basically what happens is each of these on their own can explain a lot about why, but when you put them in together, they have very little unique variability left over because they're so similar to each other. So you can see when this happens, it's almost pointless, right? Like it's almost pointless to have both of them, but you might be in a situation where you can't just choose one of them. So a case where this happens a lot is when people, um, collect data with smokers, and there are various ways that you can summarize smoking history, and they're all highly correlated. By the way, if you're one of those people, decide now before you even get to analyzing your data which of those uh, smoking measures you're going to use. I used to work with pulmonary surgeons. We always use pack years. So otherwise, you're going to you're, you're be in a bind because they're going to be so collinear and then you have a hard time choosing which one to use. So do a little research if you have collinear regressors. And to make your life easier, um, figure out which one of those you're going to end up using. You can model them both if you want, but I, I wouldn't if you didn't have to. So obvious cases of collinearity, do your work ahead of time to uh, figure out if you can just choose one over the other. Okay, why is collinearity bad? Well, here's another analogy that goes along with the other one. So here um, you can see the p-values are taking a hit, so you kind of don't want to have collinear regressors in your model. But it turns out the estimates are also really wobbly. If I just ask you, could you tell me two numbers that sum to 10? All of you who are viewing this probably are going to give different answers. You could say five and five, you could say six and four, you could say 18 and negative eight. Um, and all of those are absolutely correct answers but um, none of them, there's not a unique answer. So that's what happens when you have perfect collinearity. It's exactly this problem. You can't actually estimate the parameters for your two regressors if you just have two that are collinear with each other. We'll see that that's not always the case. Sometimes it involves more than two regressors, but um, the model's no longer estimable. If it's near perfect collinearity, like this example here, the model's estimable, but the parameter estimates will be very noisy. And that's the biggest problem. The parameter estimates will be noisy, and then your power takes a hit. Okay, so how does this impact model estimation? As I just said, if you have perfect collinearity, there's no unique solution. So it won't even estimate, or it shouldn't. Um, I know in R, if you have uh, two collinear regressors, perfectly collinear, it just doesn't estimate one, it just picks one and doesn't estimate it. If you have high collinearity, as I said, your estimates will be wobbly. In other words, they're gonna have really high variances. So for example, if you have collinear regressors in your first lev level model um, in an fMRI study, then your parameter, your parameter estimates from that model might be really noisy, which means you're gonna be having more variability between your subjects. We'll illustrate that more. I'll have a simulation example for next time. All right, so oftentimes uh, motion regressors can be correlated with task. This is more problematic for block designs. Think about why. Why, let's say I shock somebody. They get a shock for like, I don't know how long you shock people, um, half a second, they get a shock and then it goes away. Uh, why don't I have to worry so much about if they move their head, 
during the shock and how that's going to correlate or overlap with the activation that corresponds to that shock. Got any ideas? This is one of the cases where the hemodynamic delay is in your favor. If I shock you right now, we're not going to see that in your bold data for like six seconds. So as long as you get your motion out of the way before the bold signal ramps up, you know, they're, they're, they can be separated a bit. So a less um, uh, dramatic situation would be if you, if you have to have somebody speak in the scanner, um, obviously they're going to be moving and there are probably other problems associated with that. But if they only speak very quickly, they just give a one word answer or something like that. Um, it's less likely that that will be highly correlated motion along with the task, that the task and the motion won't be as correlated because if it's fast enough, if it's less than six seconds, um, the bold signal hasn't had time to catch up. So with block designs, obviously this could be a problem. So if you have a really hard task, the subject might tense up in the scanner during the block. And I've actually found myself doing this um, in the scanner. Oh, maybe I have. It's been a long time since I've done an fMRI study. But I had, had an MRI of my knee recently, and um, I definitely tensed up during that. That's more of a you realize you can't move and you don't want to move. But anyway, um, yeah. Also, if you have stimulus pairs that always occur in the same order without jittering, like this example I'm showing here, these are the two regressors where you have a stimulus that's always followed by a response, these are going to be highly collinear. So the code example I'll go over to next time will work with this type of design. And we'll look at the collinearity and possibly the efficiency and how things are messed up. We'll look at the estimates. So anyway, the good news is your p-values are okay. Uh, if you have highly collinear regressors, your tests are still valid. Although, the bad news is your power is going to take a hit because the variance is going to go up. Um, right, uh, because the, each regressor only gets this unique portion. And so when these overlap a lot and there isn't a lot of unique portion left over, um, the variability of the estimates gets bigger. The bad news is your parameter estimates won't make sense. So sometimes they can even be the wrong sign. So if the collinearity is occurring in the model that you're actually studying right now. So let's say you have collinear regressors in your group model. Um, what, could be, what could be collinear? Uh, age and reaction time are in your model. Highly collinear, or they could be, I'm imagining. Um, in that case, you have to worry about your age and reaction time specific parameter estimates in that model because if the collinearity is bad enough, your estimates will be wobbly and if you're looking at the effect sizes, they might be the wrong sign. Um, also, if this collinearity is in the first level model going back here, and you take those to the group level, so now you have these highly variable parameter estimates from your first level going into the second level, um, you're running into an outlier situation. So although generally your p-values are okay, the type 1 error is controlled, um, outliers kind of kill models. I can't think of anything that handles outliers well. I will talk about robust regression later. I do not think that's the solution unless you have 500 or more subjects. Um, more to come. So anyway, yeah. I would just be careful. If you, if you have collinear regressors in your level one analysis, go forward, be careful, look for outliers at the group level. Um, I've worked with data where someone had a parametric modulation. For each trial, they ran some sort of behavioral model to come up with uh, measures for each stimuli. And they had two behavioral models that they ran, and they wanted to uh, modulate the stimuli by each of these, and they're highly collinear. She's like, can I do it? I'm like, you can, but be careful. And sure enough, the group level results looked really weird because some of the subjects just had really wonky looking activation maps. Anyway, unfortunately, I don't have access to that data. It would be fun to show it to you. So can collinearity be avoided? Yes. Efficiency calculations, they at least ensure you have the most efficient design and the most efficient design will have the lowest collinearity among the designs you checked. Although that doesn't mean you necessarily have low collinearity if all of your designs had collinearity. Uh, another metric which I will talk about in one of the uh, later 
uh, lectures in the series is the variance inflation factor. It's a statistic that gives you a number and it has a rule of thumb. I don't know. Everybody likes rules of thumb. So that's a way to um, evaluate your collinearity uh, a little bit easier, more easily. Uh, right. And then maybe not. Sometimes you can't. You can't... Uh, you can't predict if, if you have something that's dependent upon subject's behavior. Obviously, you can't control that ahead of time. Um, unless you have a model for it, then maybe you can plan ahead. Uh, sometimes you don't expect motion to be correlated with your task, and it just happens. So, But you should check for it. You should always check for it. You should always look at your first-level design matrices and check for collinearity. And sometimes it happens because you're so carefully setting up your design matrix that you accidentally overmodel things and you have a perfect collinearity. Anyway, thank you very much. Please join the Facebook group or the Tumblr, or you can follow me on Twitter, or you could do all three. Um, yeah, and all these links are in the description box. And I'll put a link to the PLOS One paper as well. All right, you guys have a good day.